first keynote speaker of the morning, John Bunch. I love his background <laughs> relating to the diversity of eclectic experience a little bit myself. Former high school math teacher, former professional poker player, joined Zappos, recognizable from a distance because he's so tall, uh, joined Zappos in 19, 2000, 2009, I was going to say 1999, in 2009 uh, as a software engineer, was a part of the team that rolled out Holacracy, uh, is now a technical advisor to the CEO, Tony Shea, uh, and is a big part of the ongoing and just awe-inspiring efforts towards incremental change. That, that Zappos is engaged in. What's fascinating to me about Zappos is you talk about remote work, you talk about employee benefits, you talk about bringing your whole self to work in whatever iteration of that we want to speak to. And Zappos has tried it. <laughs> They've experimented with that. The difference that I see is that over the course of 20 years, they just haven't stopped. And so I'm really, really delighted to bring up John on stage. He's going to be sharing some of the history, some of the current explorations, and some of the future steps that Zappos is engaged in. So before we bring up John, I want to introduce one other hmm, way of introducing and way of welcoming our speakers. Because when we show up fully for the people who are showing up for us, they bring even more to stage. So what I'm going to ask for you and from you for the next two days is that when we're welcoming up a speaker onto the main stage or an upstairs workshop, that we stand up and give them a full standing ovation to welcome them on stage. So will you stand up, please? Thank you, Robin. Thank you so much. And thank you, everybody here. Standing ovation. Um, and, and I'll start by saying welcome. And, and uh, we're so excited uh, to have everybody here on our campus. Uh, I, I've been at Responsive a couple of years now. Um, and it's such a, a pleasure to uh, have the community that uh, Robin and team have helped to build here on uh, Zappos campus um, and exploring all these uh, ideas with us. So first, welcome. Um, so today I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about um, the evolution of Zappos. So uh, from the start of Zappos, where we are today and where we're, uh, where we're going in the next five, 10, 15 years. Um, and it all starts uh, with, it's a little bit awkward because I'm gonna be talking about somebody who's in the room uh, in the back, Tony. Um, it all starts uh, back with uh, Tony Shea. So um, Tony actually, before he uh, got involved with Zappos, uh, was with a company called Link Exchange. Um, and it was his first uh, company out of college. Um, and he uh, built that business uh, and ended up selling it to Microsoft for uh, $250 million. It was right in the dawn of the internet age. Um, but actually why he ended up selling the company uh, was because he woke up every day and he started to not enjoy coming into work. So something that he had built from the ground up um, and at, at the start of it really enjoyed it, he woke up every day and, and dreaded coming into work. And so uh, did a little reflecting about that <coughs> and said, okay, you know, as we sell this business and as I move on to the next thing, uh, the one thing that I wanna keep front and center is showing up every day and creating a place where I can have joy and passion uh, behind whatever it is that I'm doing. And so uh, that was kind of an intent of his. And as he was looking into new things, um, he started a venture firm where he started investing in a bunch of different businesses. Uh, and one of those businesses that he invested in was a, a, a company called ShoeSite.com. Um, and ShoeSite was a first of its kind. Um, this was back in 1998. Um, and they had this crazy idea that they were going to sell shoes online. Well, that sounded crazy because, you know, if you know anything about shoes, you want to try them on, right? You don't just want to, you know, have them sent to you. 
but there were a lot of barriers to that working. Back in those days, it was a crazy idea to think, well, we'll send you the shoes for free. You can try them on, and if they don't work, you can send them back to us for free. But that's exactly what they did um, in putting the customers first. Um, and so Tony invested in shoesite.com, which was founded by a guy named Nick. Um, and, uh, and as all those other uh, investments were going, he started getting more and more passionate about this one called shoesite.com. So he, he joined the company uh, uh, and became CEO, and the name was later changed to Zappos, um, which comes from the root word Zapatos, uh, uh, Spanish, for shoes. Um, so, but going back on that experience with Link Exchange, the one thing he knew he wanted to do was create a company that he was passionate about coming into every day. So one of the big changes uh, that he made was um, having a company where core values were something that was very, very um, important to the core, the DNA of the company. And so here are our core values at Zappos. If you see any Zappos people around, you can ask them to look at, look at their badge. All of our badges have our core values right there on it. Um, and a lot of companies have core values, right? But for us, since the start of Zappos, it's been something that's been really important to us. And we make some interesting uh, decisions based on the core values. So for us, um, you know, we even hire based on core values. We, we fire based on core values. Uh, we wake up every day and think about how can we exude these core values to the highest extent. So what does that look like? Well, when you're applying at Zappos, um, obviously the, there's the technical interview, right? The interview to make sure, say you're a software developer, like I got hired into at Zappos. We need to interview to make sure that, you know, you're a technical fit for the role. But for us, actually, there's a whole other interview, which is our culture interview. And even if somebody is a rock star at whatever it is that they're doing, they're the best software developer that we've seen come through these doors in 10 years, would be an amazing add to our technology team. If they don't pass the core value interview, it's a no. It's a hard no, right? And so that's an example of how we really put this first and foremost. And for instance, in our new hire training process, which is a 30-day intensive look into how our customer service uh, group uh, does its work and, and kind of learning more about, about the DNA of the company. If after that process, uh, we actually do something a little strange, which is we offer people money to quit. And the reason why we do that is because we really want people who are aligned uh, with the company aligned with the, the core values, which we talk about in the hiring process, right? But until you actually get in and live it, you probably don't really know if what, we, what we're talking about really fits with you. So if after coming in and going through the new hire process, we figure out, you figure out, eh, this, I, this company's a little bit too weird for me, or whatever it is, it's actually a good thing for you and a good thing for the company to part ways. And so I think it started as like a $200, you know, incentive to leave. But now I think it's up to two months of salary um, for people that decide uh, that this isn't for them. So core values are really, really important to us. And, and, you know, that's something that Tony put first and foremost as Zappos was founded. So Tony joined in, in, in 1999 um, and we experienced fast paced growth. So uh, in 1998, ShoeSite.com was founded, 99, Tony Invest. In 2004, we actually moved to Las Vegas. Um, Zappos was founded in San Francisco, but uh, made the move here in 2004. And in 2009, we were acquired by Amazon. By 2014, we had grown to two plus billion, dollar, uh, billion dollars in net revenue and 1,500 employees. So really, really fast paced growth. But as we got there, we kind of looked around the room. A lot of people at Zappos looked around the room and, and really got this sense that what we had been as a small startup, things had changed. So the analogy that I like to use is when we were a small startup, and even maybe when I joined in, in 2009, it felt like we were a speedboat. 
where as a company, we could make progress on things, we could go fast, and we could also change course really quickly. Like if we had some customer challenge, somebody called up and said, hey, this really isn't working for me, or hey, I've got this idea for you to do X, Y, or Z. We could take that in and adjust our course depending on what was presented to us. I mean, we're at the responsive conference, right? So what are we all trying to do? We're trying to be responsive organizations. And when we, when we were a startup, we really felt like that was possible. But as we grew, we started feeling more like this, like a cruise ship. Now, there's a lot of benefits of being a cruise ship, right? You got the pool deck, you got amazing restaurants. It's a comfy place to be, right? It's not all bad. And cruise ships are making progress too. They're going forward, right? But if you want to change course, it might take 30 minutes to adjust, right? And so this is really what we felt like we were, we were becoming. If we got some input from a customer, it felt like it might be a six month or year long process to take that in and make some change. And we realized we got to get back to our roots. So kind of what we set out to do is something maybe a little more like this. Um, so I call this the badass Zappos cruise ship. The best, of, the best of both worlds. We don't want to lose the amazing amenities. We don't want to lose the pool deck on top, right? But what we do want to bring back is that ability to change course quickly um, uh, and, and be responsive. So how do we do that? Well, in 2014, we really started thinking about this more. We started doing some research. So um, we came across a few books that really inspired us to think about how we can become more responsive. The first, is one, first one is called Triumph of the City by a Harvard professor named Ed Glazier. And what he talks about in the book is that we're at an amazing time in history right now. For the first time in human history, um, there's actually more people living in cities than live in rural areas. And why is that? So we dug into that a little bit. And what he found <clears throat> was kind of interesting. And, and the research showed that every time the, the size of a city doubles, productivity per resident goes up by 15%. But what we find in organizations is the exact opposite thing. So as we grow in size, Productivity per employee goes down in most organizations. And I think we get the sense of this, right? As you grow, it just becomes harder to get things done. Now, obviously, as you add people, you're adding capacity, but it's sublinear. And cities are actually the opposite. They're exponential. So as cities grow, they get more productive on a per, per resident basis. So that was one kind of spark for us was thinking, how can we structure ourselves more like a city and less like a traditional organization? The other book that really inspired us was one called Reinventing Organizations. And I'm sure a lot, I heard some mm-hmm's. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have, have read this by an amazing guy, uh, Frederick Lalu. And in this book, he talks about a number of things. Robin mentioned bringing your whole self to work. That's one of the core components that he talks about, um, along with evol evolutionary uh, purpose and self-organization. But he, he also talks about a number of different paradigm shifts that are needed to uh, move into this next stage of organization that he feels like is emerging in today's day and age. And so here, here are the five transformations. From profit to purpose from hierarchies to networks, from controlling to empowering, from a planning mindset to an experimentation mindset, and from privacy to transparency. So all of these transformations really resonated with us at Zappos. And we really thought, you know, if we could nail the things on the right side of this column, if we could get them just right, it would get us back to that responsive nature. So these two books really inspired us, and we started thinking about, okay, 
how do we do it? How do we do it? I mean, we had grown, uh, you know, from the start of Zappos, just in a, we weren't a traditional company by any stretch of the imagination, but from an organizational design perspective, we were a fairly traditional company. Like we had grown with a, a traditional hierarchy. We had grown with uh, reporting structures that looked very similar to, uh, to that of many other companies. And, and we felt like a lot of those structures or ways that we were going about doing things were reinforcing the areas on the left side of this, right? Oftentimes not intentionally by anybody, but just because that's the way the, the organization was structured. So we looked around, how can, is there a system that helps us move the needle to the right? And so we found uh, one after doing research called Holacracy. So uh, I won't spend too long talking about this, uh, Brian, uh, the co-founder of Holacracy, uh, I think is going to be here doing a, doing a Q&A. Um, so he'll talk more about it. Um, but, you know, essentially what Holacracy did for us is it took this traditional hierarchy uh, that we had grown into and changed it from that to uh, this. On the right, uh, this is a our organization broken down instead of a hierarchy of people into a hierarchy of work or a hierarchy of purpose. So the question becomes not who are the people in the organization and how do we structure the people, but rather what is the work that the organization needs to do or what is the purpose that we're trying to achieve at Zappos? For us, it's to live and deliver wow. And how do we break down that purpose of live and deliver wow to all the different areas of work that we could be doing to pursue that purpose. And so how we do that is, is we create circles, uh, which are essentially areas of work or areas of purpose, and roles within those circles. And then we think about there's a system and a process for, okay, now that we've got that broken down, who in the organization is the best person to fill in that area of work, right? Or maybe do we not have the right person and we need to, uh, find somebody to fill in that area of work, right? But the question is, what is the work that needs to get done to fulfill the purpose? So what does that look like in practice? Well, here's one, uh, one of our Zapodians, Krista Foley. And uh, she actually today uh, holds 37 roles in 14 different circles. Sounds kind of crazy, right? So from before where, you know, she was in the traditional hierarchy in a certain place, she had one kind of, one, one purpose in the organization, to now she's in 14 different circles, 14 distinct different areas uh, of purpose, and 37 distinct roles within that. So holacracy is a much bigger process that I'm going to kind of talk all the way through here today. But just this one change, I think, is really uh, really important um, and really exciting and really made a big impact uh, for us at Zappos. And what it really unlocked or enabled is people to have ideas, be sensing things coming in from customers, and be able to create circles around those ideas, create, create new areas of work around those ideas. And we saw some really interesting uh, new things that got unpacked within this system of Holacracy. So one example of that uh, is something called Zappos Adaptive. So Zappos Adaptive is a new shopping experience for people with special needs. Um, and the group of folks that worked on this saw a customer need and organized a circle around it and started working on that circle. Now, obviously they had other areas of work that they were focused on, right? And that's fine, that's possible within Holacracy. But they were able to pursue this idea that was meeting a, a customer need uh, within this new, new, new framework. So I wanted to show you a, a short video about that. Here at Zappos, our customers are our family and family comes first. Zappos Adaptive started with a phone call. One of our customers needed help finding shoes for her grandson who could not tie his own laces. 
The more we understood the needs of this customer, we realized that there are also many other people who face similar challenges in their everyday lives while getting dressed. And there isn't enough being done. Until now, this one call, this one spark, would go on to ignite a movement here at Zappos. A lot of people ask, what is adaptive clothing? And adaptive clothing is really anything that's going to make anyone with a disability or anyone who is somehow impaired be able to get dressed in record time without any mistakes. Well, kids and individuals with special needs of all ages oftentimes have to depend on caregivers and providers to help them do everything, whether they're in a wheelchair or they have autism or Down syndrome, fine motor issues, sensory issues, they're always depending on others. And the more we can make these individuals um, independent and successful out in the community, the better. Our reversible clothing that can be worn front to back or inside out helps make getting dressed a breeze. We have many products that are tagless or have tearaway tags, so you don't need to worry about that annoying, itchy feeling. You'll want to cuddle in our amazing super soft tops, bottoms, and underwear. We've also made it effortless to find all kinds of shoes that fit a variety of needs. The Zappos adaptive shopping experience is just going to be the game changer for 50 million Americans with disabilities. That population has been almost completely ignored by the major designers and retailers up until now. Zappos Adaptive is inclusive. It's the future. I feel like it's the future for fashion for people with disabilities. <clears throat> this is just the beginning. We are working on adding more innovative clothing and footwear to Zappos Adaptive. We would love to get your feedback through the survey on our website so we can expand our offering. Zappos Adaptive, functional and fashionable products to make life easier. Yes. Very exciting. And how that was unlocked was unlocking the potential of these people, right? With an idea to create work, to create something that unlocks something for a customer. So back to this, back to the reinventing organization mindset shifts. We implemented Holacracy. Um, but one thing that we sensed was that we still, so in Holacracy, it's a hierarchy of work, and it's also a hierarchy of resource allocation. So, uh, you know, there's a, there's a structure of circles, and how we allocate resources down to them in Holacracy is hierarchical. So the GCC, the general company circle, has a budget, and then that gets passed down via the, the work hierarchy. And so one thing that we really sensed was there's more to do here in terms of moving from a hierarchy to a network. And that's really led to our next transition that I'm going to talk to you a little bit about today. And also, Tony, our CEO, is, is uh, doing a fireside chat, I think, tomorrow. Um, and uh, we'll be digging more, even more into detail uh, on this concept. But, uh, you know, so... This is kind of what holacracy looks like, right? A hierarchy of circles. Um, but what we really wanted to move into is a more networked approach. So instead of that resource allocation coming top down, how do we make it more of a network? So here are our, our, uh, our external business offering. This is where money is coming into the organization. And so we thought about how do we make this more of a network? So Instead of it coming straight in top down, how do we understand what value each circle is providing within the organization and then have the people that they're providing value to directly pay them for their services? And what does this unlock? Well, you know, going back to the way that resource allocation is done in Holacracy top down, it makes it such that Tony as our CEO has to figure out for the sub-circles right under GCC, how much money or how much resources do we give to this area? And how much do we give to that area? How much do we give to that area? And as smart as Tony is, he can't be a good sensor for everywhere in the organization, right? So getting back to how do we become more responsive? So the big idea here is how do we put the budget into the customer's hands and realizing that everybody has a customer. So, you know, Zappos, we like to think of ourselves as a customer service company that just happens to sell blank. 
So we're known for selling shoes and clothes online. Um, but actually, we think about that the same way internally. So every person in, in Zappos is a customer service person that just happens to sell blank internally, right? And what that enables is for us to really connect the value directly to the customer. So we moved, we call this internally market-based dynamics um, or customer-generated budgeting, this process of doing it in this way. And uh, we started thinking about how do we do this? And this is a change or a transformation that we made in the last couple of years. So this is kind of the next evolution uh, of where we're going. And so 2019 was the first year we did customer generated budgeting where instead of it coming directly top down, uh, your budget came from your customers. And so we started to do that. And we you know, hope that right now we've started to do this internally where you understand who your customers are and are paid directly by them. But over the long run, the right is what we wanna see. So if you're really, really good at providing some customer value internally, let's say uh, you're the AV team. I'll pick on the AV team. You're the AV team, you run AV uh, events for Zappos. Why wouldn't you be amazing at doing that externally as well, right? And so actually, happy to report that the AV team is here uh, helping with the responsive conference, right? That's an example of how we can evolve our company and start to provide more value, not just internally, uh, but externally. So this is on the right is really the vision of where we wanna get a robust internal ecosystem that serves the inside of the company, but also serves more and more people outside. So Tony's gonna talk more about this, um, but I also wanted to note that, you know, one of the things that's enabling this is, as a possibility and I think one of the things we need to think about more in today's day and age or across our organizations is that technology is an enabler. So why traditionally have companies been structured as a hierarchy? And why traditionally have companies uh, not done something more like a market-based dynamics? Well, when you think about creating all those transactions between the different groups, that would be really hard to do based on some sort of paper-based system, right? So we also realize that technology can be an enabler of this vision. So one of the things that we've also been working on is something internally we call the CFO tool. Um, and what the CFO tool does is helps us understand the, that, those network connections and the agreements between the different teams. So this is an example of the think circle um, and uh, and this is their kind of operating. This is what they're doing to operate. You'll notice in the top right, they have a bank account balance. So the way we think about these circles internally is that they're micro enterprises. They're independent, operating on their own micro enterprises. And so they have their own bank account and they can do whatever they want to with that bank account, right? They have customers who are paying them directly for the value that they're providing and they have the autonomy to do what they think is right with the money that's coming into their business, just as you would with any small business, right? So Robin's Cafe, they're creating a business, they've got customers who are willing to pay them, and they get to decide what they do with the, the money that's coming in. Obviously, they have the cost of their goods that they're selling, right? But with their profit, they get to figure out what they're gonna do with that, reinvest in the business, pay their employees more, and that's really the vision of, of where we're trying to get to. So this is just another slide and it's showing off the service agreements that Think has with other areas of the business. So funding becomes, instead of top down, one to one, a one to many uh, sort of thing where each circle has the potential to create many service agreements throughout the organization. And one of the, the things that we're really excited that this unlocks is changing it in kind of the old world, even in holacracy, from it only takes one no to shut something down. So if you went to your super circle lead link and said, I've got this amazing idea and I just need $5,000 to do an MVP to get it off the ground. If they said no, that was really your only source for, for finding funding for that idea. 
In market-based dynamics, it only takes one yes to get something going. So let's say I pitched something to Dustin and said, I've got this amazing idea. It's going to take me $5,000 to do an MVP. And he said, uh, I don't really get it. No. Or uh, I get it, but I don't have the funds to help you out. And let's say I asked 10 different people that, and they all said no. That's fine. It only takes one yes to get something going. So that 11th person that I talked to, they get it. They see the vision. Boom. We get the investment. We get started. So that's one of the things we're really, really excited about within, within MBD. This is how we, uh, so talk about um, what does this mean to how we've done business at Zappos. So this is something we call the triangle of accountability. So what this all adds up to is what we're looking to do is create the minimum amount of constraints to enable the maximum amount of freedom and accountability within Zappos. And so when we talk about a constraint, we're talking about like our core values. That's a constraint on what we're doing at Zappos. Everything that we do needs to be aligned with our core values, right? That's been true since day one. The other constraint that we have is that, um, is that we always want to be customer focused, have a customer focused mindset, or provide the very best customer experience in whatever it is that we're doing. So I talked about Zappos is a customer service company that just happens to sell blank. This side of the triangle of accountability is what speaks to that. And the last in the bottom is customer generated budgeting or balancing your circles P and L. So what this adds on top of that or layers in is that everything we need we do needs to have financial sustainability baked into it. So you need to have some customer who's willing to pay you uh, to unlock that value uh, that you're looking to do. And so if as you walk around Zappos, you'll probably see this uh, plastered many, many different places. Um, we've got an amazing team uh, that helps to spread the word about uh, customer, about market-based dynamics, and also helps people to really understand it. And this is one of the things that was created to help people understand what it is that we're trying to do. Um, so that was a very, very quick whirlwind in what we're trying to do. But let's just go back and, and remind us why again. So Darwin said, it's not the fastest or the strongest that survives, it's the ones that are most adaptive to change. And we see that in today's business landscape. So companies are dying at a faster and faster rate than ever. Right? We see that. Also, companies are being born at a faster rate than ever. So at Zappos, we're really trying to think, how can we avoid this? We want to be a company that's around not just in five years, not just in 10 years, but 100 years and 1,000 years. So when you think about creating a business that's around in 1,000 years, you got to be pretty adaptable to change. Right? And that's what we're trying to do here. So I'll leave with one quote. <clears throat> Great leaders of innovation see their role not as take charge direction setters, but as creators of a context in which others make innovation happen. And so adapt, Zappos Adaptive, I think, is one great example. Um, but if you come back to us in five or 10 years, I hope that we have hundreds and thousands more. So thank you. Thank you.